All right, good morning. How is everybody? Good. I'm surprised a lot of you made it. I started getting a lot of emails saying, I can't make it. My kids don't have class, so I won't be there. So it's nice to see that uh, a lot of the energy did come out. So we have some critical review questions that I asked last time, the first of which was, is it possible to pursue an irrational goal from a rational perspective? And this is important, I think, as we get into the discussion, we'll figure out why this is important to think about this. And then the second was, is there a synthesis between what we might call rational actor theory and the antithesis, which is maybe called irrational actor theory, that says people buy just based on sort of a, a reaction to stimuli. And there is a thinker now whose name is Martin Lindstrom. He's written a book, I think I've mentioned it before, called Biology, B-U-I. This is a test question, O-L-O-G-Y, Biology, by Lindstrom. In which he argues that people really are pretty irrational and that we can use functional uh, MRI technology to look at what is going on in people's mind when they buy and what kinds of things uh, uh, are they thinking about or what parts of the brain are being triggered. For example, the pleasure center of the brain when people buy. We do know that people get a little charge when they buy things. Buying makes you happy. So there's an age-old adage that says money can't buy happiness, right? But it turns out it can delay depression when you buy the same things that trigger the little uh, happy receptors in the brain as when you take a bite of the chocolate cake or a hit of the Mary Jane or uh, a drink of the bottle, all fire at the same thing uh, when you purchase something. So it can delay depression. So with that, uh, why don't you the group folks people stand up so we can number off. Who's got the... Hopefully, the person from your group. Number one, what's your what is your answer? So the person wants to pursue an irrational goal in a rational manner. Yep. Um, the way we approached this was, I think everyone, all of us, might have an irrational goal in the sense that uh, somebody may want to not die. That's kind of an irrational goal because that's trying to de uh, delay the inevitable. Everyone's going to die eventually. Oh, okay. And so you can take that and try to pursue that goal and take um, certain measures to maybe delay or prevent that from happening uh, sooner. So, for example, if you don't want to die, you could uh, eat more healthy or be more active, or you can even like kind of hold yourself away, kind of uh, hold yourself hold yourself off from the world, so that way there's you no know, like outside factors that might. Uh, potentially hurt you or harm you or even kill you. And then for the second one, for the second question was, is there a synthesis between rational and irrational? I took a, we took like a more philosoph uh, philosophical approach to this and said that I guess we could be irrational and rational actors because we're not in a perfect world. We're not perfect people. And so at times we can be very rational. We can think our way through and make a weigh the cause and the benefits of a certain decision and go through that. But then there's other times with environmental factors or stuff around you that might influence your decision making. 
And so that's where you can be irrational. Okay. Um, can you give an example? Um, let's say you and I get into a little argument. You uh, have a, you take a side and you say something that may not work with me or I may not believe the same thing that you do. Now the rational thing is that I could, I could say that I don't believe your opinion might be the best opinion and take it in a more rational manner and explain and talk very civilly or I can be irrational and just because you don't agree with me, I can kind of lash out to you, uh, verbally abuse you or even this. Okay. Yeah, we see people do that all the time, particularly on uh, the news where it's no longer a rational debate on many things. You have one side over here, they have the Democrats on one side, the Republicans on the other, and they just sit there and talk past each other, and that is a good example. It's a, a, a book was written on this uh, called by George Lakoff called Moral Politics, who talks about that, that we use these same terms, but we talk past each other, and it's not necessarily a rational dialogue, so I think that's very good. All right, so number two. An example of this could be looking at the company um, Apple products. When they come out with a new phone, you feel like it's outdated and old, but really your phone is functioning perfectly. With the de desirable commercials and exclusiveness of the phone, the unsatisfied want and irrational need is formed. Although the want is irrational, you can still go about buying the phone in a very rational way. Meaning you could research the cost, color, find the best deal, and even sell your old phone to lock it for new phone. This is, a, this is satisfying your rational want in a very rational way. Okay, yeah. You've picked up on something that uh, a lot of philosophers say marketers are now doing, is creating something called affluenza, this desire to have things that we don't really need. But yes, you can pursue that in a rational way, so that's good. What about, um, is there a synthesis between the two? Okay, all right, all right, very good. Number three. There's no point in pursuing it from a rational perspective because it's inherently irrational. That that does make some sense. All right. I would say, I would say just like it's just risky. You know, you can approach this uh, goal in a, in a traditional manner, but it would it would be just risky. It's right. Like it's like some venture business or small business, or small budget. Okay. All right. Number four. Well, the first question is about possible to pursue irrational goal in a rational manner. For well, that, I would like to relate it to the curiosity and wants of the customers and people. For uh -huh. well, that, like, for example, if many years ago, fly in the sky, people just think that it's crazy thought. But with technology, we have aircraft now, and traveling in space is like impossible possible. It's not even really possible to travel in space. But with technology, we have rockets. And that traveling in space and flying in the sky many years ago, it's an irrational goal. But with technology, it became a rational goal. And for the second question, 
is it a synthesis between rational actor and irrational actor? Well, that I would like to say that we need to know the, the difference between want and need. It goes the same to the market. We need to know the wants and need of the customers to market our product. And that I would like to give an example of buying ex expensive stuff. For example, I just graduated from undergraduate school and I haven't got a job. Okay, that's a problem. And I haven't got a job. And my goal is next month I'm going to get a Ferrari. That's totally impossible. So in order to get that in to achieve my goal, there's a few options. I can borrow money from the bank, borrow money from parents maybe, and borrow, borrow money or give them uh, or do installment to get car. Well, that's the synthesis between Russian actor and British actor. That's our uh, good size. Okay, so I think that's, that's an important thing. To recognize that there's a difference between want and need. Right? There are basic things that we want. I would ask you then, are some things that we used to think of as being a want now actually a need to function? So for example, I had a cell phone when I was 16 years old. I graduated from Guthrie High School in 1992. I'm aging myself, right? That's a long time ago. Most of you were, uh, were you know, in diapers, were not even born yet in 1992. So at that point in time, nobody had a cell phone. It was a really luxury item. It was a bag phone that weighed about seven pounds and it plugged into a cigarette lighter and the battery lasted all of about, I don't know, if you were talking on it, 10 minutes, maybe. Huge battery, lasted 10 minutes, cost 1,500 bucks. That was definitely a luxury at that point in time. Is a cell phone a luxury anymore or has it become a need? I think it's become a need. Most people don't have home phones anymore and if you want to have a job or get in contact with people, you may need this more than you want it. In fact, a lot of us don't really like these devices anymore, right? It's now an electronic leash that allows our employers to keep track of us, maybe. So some things that maybe started out as wants can, can morph into needs based on you know, the technological advances of society, OK? Number, number five. Right. Um, we said that. Sometimes you can worry something that's irrational in a rational way long enough that that goal that is rational becomes rational, if that makes sense. So like for example, like three years ago, the football team years, 2 and 2 and 8 was very terrible for a long period of time. But now we've improved, you know, to where we're at now where we finished second in the conference. So the goal, our goal has always been national championship, but now that we're making those steps rationally to get better, that goal is more rational than it was at the beginning. So if you continue to work at it in a rational way, then the goal becomes more rational than it was initially. Um, and then in business, we said that um, there is a synthesis because sometimes risks um, are irrational, but they end up giving the best results. Um, the idea that Facebook would have blown up like it did was probably irrational at the time, but now it's a mega company. So you know, in business, sometimes the biggest risks end up with the, um, you know, the biggest rewards because at the beginning, they don't seem like that would work out, but if it does, in fact, it's kind of end up being a pretty good deal. And it had a huge impact on uh, global events, right? I mean, the Arab Spring and these revolutions that we saw across the world were really uh, uh, able to come about as a result of marketing efforts on the part of citizens in those nations who were able to connect and get their ideas into this sort of marketplace of ideas more easily than they had been before when news and information were controlled by a central figure in the government and everything had to support that goal, right? I mean, it's one thing to think dissident thoughts, it's another to be able to broadcast those. And so, yeah, I think they had a, a huge impact on that. And it is, it's one of those things that just exploded. Okay, number six. For our first question, we said that it is possible um, because even if your goal is, is irrational, um, you can still make that. You can still um, approach it rationally. Like if you were to meet somebody, you can still go and buy a gun and you can still be someone logical about that. It's not a logical goal. Um, and regarding our second one, we said that um, they can be, uh, there is a synthesis because. Um, like with shopping, for example, the marketers use it with shopping. Like if you go into a store and you have a budget and you try and stick to that budget and um, almost make a reasonable amount of money on certain items, you might be led to act irrationally if you 
see there's a sale. And so I think sometimes some stores, um, like stores like Kohl's, where they always have things on sale, um, it kind of seems like they just, they say that their price is higher than it actually set it, and then they just set it to a sale price that um, they sort of, because they want to look at it's on sale. Okay, so yeah, you've got this idea of a budget that you can stick to the budget. What about, do people actually do that? Do they actually budget in the United States? No, because one of the suggestions that people suggest is that, like for grocery shopping, is that you always need the list before you go to the store, and you never spend more than that. But I don't, I don't know anybody that actually does that. And how many people, I mean, everybody knows, right, from their own experience, you should never go to the store when you're hungry. Right. And how many people, I have a PhD, and I still go to the store when I'm hungry. And I still buy, you know, I know what's happening as I'm putting stuff into my cart, I know what's going on and yet I still do it. And uh, so is it possible? The other thing is, is like with regard to uh, a budget and savings, if we were really all that rational, what percentage of you would have big savings accounts for retirement, given the fact that pensions are a thing of the past? Unless you have a job like mine, where you work for a governmental entity where they give you a defined benefit plan, the reason I came back here to UCF, right, in spite of the fact that I had much better job offers in other places, and in spite of the fact that I made a hell of a lot more money as a corporate attorney than I ever did as a college professor, was because I, when I get in 10 years, and the clock is counting down, I can't wait, uh, you know, I will get 70% of my salary uh, to me every month you know, for the rest of my life. Most of you won't have that. Knowing, and you know that. You're sitting here knowing that. What percentage of Americans actually bother to save? The average 401k or 403b account in the United States today has only got $50,000 in it. And when we say average, that's half of the population. Only half of the population actually has any kind of retirement savings. Is that at all rational? Maybe not. All right, number seven. Said, yes, it is possible to pursue an irrational goal in a rational manner. Uh, referring back to needs and wants, um, many decisions aren't rational. Um, they're just acting on impulse. That's kind of just how they act. Um, as far as the synthesis between them, we said you can't have one without having the other. Um, you know, order and chaos, like dark, you have to have one. Have the other. Um, our examples were uh, charities saying if they have a deadline of a week and they needed you know, a million dollars, they're probably not going to hit that in a week. But any amount of money is going to be good. And even if they had a lower goal and they hit that goal, that would limit them and they wouldn't ask for any more money. So stop. So that's an act of Okay. All right, you've got a couple of things that are kind of interesting. This, like your analogy of light and dark. Yeah. Um, that actually is used a lot in an in a, in a old time uh, philosophy on religion that has gone out of fashion, and it's called Manichaeanism. And what the Manichae believes is that it's not that God doesn't want to end suffering in the world, it's that he's not powerful enough. Just as you have to have uh, light in a painting, so must you have shadow in order to highlight the light in the painting. So it's a necessary sort of evil. Um, there's lots of problems with Manichaeanism from a theological standpoint, but I think it's an interesting perspective that, yeah, you have to have sort of a balance of both. And we are both rational actors and emotive actors at the same time as human beings. So I think that's kind of interesting that you picked up on that. All right, very good. Let's see, number eight. Invest the money 
and um, declining stock in hopes the stock would rebound, though there was no data to support their decision that rational people would invest the stock as um, history of rebounding trends um, during specific quarters. Okay. All right. Do you think that it's irrational to invest in oil and gas right now, then? Do you think it's at the bottom? It is. I started to go back. I mean, gas prices have started to go back up. Will it hit $100 a barrel anytime soon again? I don't know. You know um, there's conflicting. The uh, Saudi foreign minister says that it could hit $200 a barrel. Most of the economists from the European Union and the United States say that it's five years before it will hit $100 a barrel again. But economists are notoriously bad at doing what? Their job. Predicting anything, <laughs> right? Yeah, they're notoriously bad at predicting. Eco economics is one of the foundational disciplines of marketing, and I make merciless fun, because they're always really good at explaining things after it's happened. Well, anyone can do that, right? I mean, that, there's an old adage that says hindsight is what? 2020. We could always we could always analyze stuff after it's happened. Are you any good at predicting anything beforehand? And I don't think they really are. All right. Let's see. Number are we at number nine? Uh, we think it is possible to pursue an irrational or irrational matter because if you establish your goal, you discover objectives for it, and then you go out step by step to try to accomplish it. And marketing a firm can set up to reach 100 percent of the population. Uh, they do that by making their goal, discovering what they need to do, and then take step by step, even though they might not get the 100% of the population, uh, the more they get, I guess, the better they'll be off. And we think there is a, a synthesis in between both of those, because they both uh, want to max, maximize their happiness. And an example is if you go into the grocery store hungry uh, and you see some chips, the irrational side of you wants to go get chips, but once you get to the chip box, the irrational side of you has to decide which chip you want to maximize your happiness. So you could choose sun chips instead of potato chips or baked chips or something like that. Okay. All right. Interesting. Number 10. So we said yes. Uh, we thought it was possible because rationality is based on perception. And we said you can have a plan that is like creative, but it might be irrational. But you can have a rational way to make that like plan work out. We said like if you want to like lift a car or something, that's a pretty irrational uh, thing. But you could maybe kind of work out or something that'd be a rational step, kind of. And the second one, we also said yes, there's synthesis. Uh, one of our examples was like Black Friday or like sales. People have like a rationale, like it's rational to want to save money, but they'll maybe like buy way more than what they need in like an irrational way. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, I think that's a good example in terms of uh, marketing. We do trigger people's desire to get a good deal, right? But do you really know that you're getting a good deal anymore? We'll talk when we get to pricing, that's an interesting question. Can you really figure out, the, I mean, you have to be a mathematician to figure out the pricing schemes of some, uh, of some products and some types of sales. Macy's is forever putting things on sale. So is it really a sale when every other day is you know, a Macy's sale, a red tag sale, a Black Friday sale, something like that? OK, number 11. Okay, so you picked up on corporations and pursuit of stockholder wealth. Milton Friedman argues that the only legitimate goal of business is to make money, is to increase stockholder wealth. But is that really true?
true? I mean, he says that all of this idea of when he was alive, he's dead now, I think, um, of corporate social responsibility is basically cheating shareholders out of their money. But are we really cheating shareholders out of their money? Or is it rational to engage in corporate social responsibility? You think it's rational? Yeah. 85% uh, of people say they'd rather do business with corporations that engage in corporate social responsibility. So maybe maybe it does improve the bottom line, so it's ultimately a rational goal. Okay, all right, number 12. Uh, so the first question, we said that it is uh, possible to pursue a rational goal rationally. Uh, most of our goals uh, start out as irrational. Um, we have to work at them in rational steps to get there. Um, and then the second question, we said that there is a synthesis between uh, irrational and rational. Um, we also said the same thing. Uh, things that are rational can change into being rational. So um, our example would be, I think someone else might have said it, but um, 100 years ago, putting someone on the moon would, would be an irrational um, idea. But 60 something years later, uh, that is actual and rational thought. Um, today it's not too, too extreme. They're talking about going to Mars and whatnot. So um, we, do, we do think that something irrational can change into being rational. Okay. All right. So because of technology, something that seems completely impossible uh, could become absolutely possible. In your example about weightlifting, yeah, you can. People do this extreme weightlifting stuff all the time. They have these, uh, what are they, muscle challenges and stuff to see if they can pull semis or how many semi tractor trailer rigs they can pull it you know seems kind of silly but you can sort of do it can anybody i think this may be one of the things that is sort of interesting can you achieve anything that you want to i mean we tell students you can be anything that you want to be well I i'm never going to be a thunder basketball player right I i'm far too short to be a thunder basketball player I wanted to be a country and western superstar, but I'm a tone-deaf, flat baritone. So I became a college professor instead, right? So I could have an audience. I don't know that I was ever going to be that. But, you know, we at least hope, or we tell children that they can. Okay, number 13. Uh, all right, so we said that, yes, it is possible to pursue in a rational manner. Uh, and we kind of thought along the lines of, if uh, you need money, say you set a goal, I'm going to rob a bank. Uh, which is an irrational goal, but you can go about it in a rational manner as, as far as you can think like, oh, well, do we want to try and do this with less people so that we can get in now, or do we want to go with a lot of people and then kind of thing? Like, you can make rational choices about it, but in the long run, it's an irrational goal. Uh, and then you said, uh, as far as synthesis goes, we, we think there is because uh, both irrational and rational goals kind of stem from kind of base desires like wants and needs. Uh, and and so uh, our example was like if you need new clothes, uh, you can go out to like Old Navy or, or something and buy some like fairly cheap clothes, or you can go to like Brooks Brothers and spend a whole lot of money. And uh, like to one person that may not be like a big deal, like that could be chump change to them. But if you're spending half your paycheck, that's kind of irrational. But either way, you still fulfill your goal of getting new clothes. Okay. So they kind of work together that way. Uh, so that's what that's what we. Okay, so you touched on something that uh, we'll talk about this when we get to price more, but I want to ask you this question. With regard to this idea of rational, is it really rational or is it irrational to say that the person who shops at Brooks Brothers is acting irrationally on this need to sort of want to project an image, or are the clothes of a different quality at Brooks Brothers than you get at Old Navy? How many of you shopped at Old Navy? Almost everybody's shopped at Old Navy, right? Let's see hands. How many of you shopped at Old Navy? Why do you shop at Old Navy? It's cheap, right? Does it last? Is it as well made? No. I'm not sure that it is. Is it as well made as the Brooks Brothers suit? Maybe not. By the way, generally speaking, what's better made, men's clothing or women's clothing? Men's clothing is generally better made. So that's kind of an interesting fact. And people wouldn't think that. If the, quali the quality is generally higher in men's clothing than it is in women's. Why is that? Because men don't shop nearly as much as women. Huh? Because men don't shop as much as women. Yeah, they don't. They keep things a lot longer. 
And styles don't change nearly as fast for men as they do for women. A button-down shirt is a button-down shirt. There's not many things that you can do to it. You could, you know, take away pockets, maybe make it a slim cut, things like that. All right, let's see. 14. So we said um, it is possible, but however, by human nature, it's more of a thought process. So, like, wanting to become a millionaire is probably most likely irrational because there aren't really many out there. So, and it's kind of like what you said. Anybody to me can say, oh, you can do whatever you want. But for me, I say it's probably more rational to go play basketball overseas than be a Thunder player. So, I mean, uh, the synthesis, rational and irrational, between the two, both is a personal preference. Say, like, I, if I really wanted a gallon of orange juice, and it was $100. And I really, really wanted it, then I'd probably go out and pay $100. So that becomes more of a uh, irrational choice instead of like probably nobody else would want to pay them, but for yeah, one. Okay. So is it irrational to think that you'll become a millionaire? No, I mean no. But if you want to retire well, you better start thinking about becoming a millionaire. You know, in terms of savings and your 401k, 403b, Roth IRAs, things like that, investments. Uh, there are a lot of millionaires. Is a million, when I was growing up, if you had a million dollars in the bank, you could retire pretty comfortably. Can you retire comfortably on a million dollars today? I don't know. Depends on what your lifestyle is. What's the income going to be off of a million dollars a year if you, just, if you don't want to touch the principal and outlive it? Depends on what your return is. So maybe it's not as irrational. Maybe becoming a billionaire now is more irrational than, yeah. than, than being a millionaire. All right, very good. Do we have anybody else? Did I miss anybody? Is there any group that didn't get to go? Okay. So I think you all did a really good job of coming up with this idea. It is possible, I think, to pursue an irrational goal from a rational perspective. It may not be rational to want the things that we want, but if you do want something really badly, you can go about it in a fairly rational, uh, comprehensive way, right? So it's probably not rational to want, for example, a Rolex watch, which is what I wanted for my 18th birthday or for my actual high school graduation, and I browbeat my parents until I got one, right? My life would not be complete until I had a Rolex watch, and I got it, and I walked around for about two years saying, you want to know what time it is? Because you know, it's a Rolex. Not that it tells me time. That may be an irrational goal, but I went about getting it in a very rational, comprehensive manner. In the extreme case, I think we could say that Nazi Germany, for example, pursued a completely irrational goal in a very rational manner, right? They tried different ways of exterminating large portions of their population, and they got very efficient at it. If you want to engage in a killing machine, which is, I think, ultimately an irrational goal, they did it in a fairly rational, comprehensive uh, way. With regard to the synthesis, I think you all came up with some really good ideas. And I think what you see is that depending on the level of risk, we may become more or less rational. So everybody has a need for housing. We can't just live out on the plains like the buffalo. And so that risk, though, in terms of your purchasing, is one of the most risky that you will take. And it's the largest purchase that most Americans will take. Are they more rational in that purchase decision, the purchasing of a house, than say the purchasing of a gallon of milk? I think absolutely they are. They are much more rational. When you, when you think about spending a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars, what's the average home in Edmond cost? $250,000 is the average home in Edmond. What's the average home in Oklahoma? It hovers right at about 100,000, taking the state as a whole. But that's taking in places like Goaty Bow and Bow Legs and Broken Bow. And what's the other one that's down by Broken Bow? Ida Bell. They're like right across the street from each other, and yet they hate each other. Ida Bell and Broken Bow, they'll, they'll have this huge rivalry. I'll tell you that people from Broken Bow are not to be trusted with my bill. 
there's not a damn bit of difference between the two of you. You're right there, south, you know, southeastern Oklahoma. So that's a big purchase, $100,000. And when you think about how long you're going to be paying for it, what's the average mortgage? 30 years. I think people become much more rational. So they shop not just for the house, but also for what? Mortgage products, right? Who's going to give you the best deal in terms of that lifetime uh, commitment to that loan? And so I think we do become more rational. Although you see elements of irrationality sneak in. So for example, I had a client one time that was trying to sell her house, and her realtor had told her that she needed to change the carpet up. She said, no, we'll just give them a carpeting allowance. And then they can choose whatever carpet they want. And people would come in the house, and they'd say, you know that house down the street had new carpet. Now, what's the more rational decision, to choose the house down the street with the new carpet, or to take the carpeting allowance? Take the carpeting allowance because you get what? You get the carpet that you want. But people have a hard time visualizing that. What are the number one things that you can do to not sell your home? Well, have pets in the home because people walk in and what happens if there's an odor in the house? They have an instant negative reaction to the house. Not have new carpet and not have freshly painted walls. Are any of those things rational? I bought a home in Edgemere Park, which is a very expensive part of Oklahoma City, for far less than market value because they had had tenants in it and the tenants had Great Danes. And so there's this slobber all over the wall. And it smelled like large dog in there. And nobody who walked in the door could see past the fact that there was slobber on the wall and there was the smell of large dog. And Great Danes stink if you have them inside and they kept them inside. And the, the floors were torn up as a result. But I could look past that and I bought a house for a lot cheaper than, than I thought I would because they had no offers on it. It's out of the market. We need to talk about organizations and business to business. Now, when we talk about business to business, let me ask you this. Do you think businesses are more rational than individuals in their purchasing decisions? You say, of course. Why? When it was like a company, they create demand based uh, and then, like, teaching for the decisions is still the team of those, and it's very, very, uh, guess the foundation for explanation. And for customers, just like, oh, I saw you like it, there's no point of business. I can provide this. It's basically what you can provide each new iPhone here each six months. Mm -hmm. For me, for instance, it is irrational because it doesn't make any sense for you to get, like, 500 pixels or 600 pixels. But yeah, do people even know what pixels really mean? Can you tell the difference between 300 pixels and 600 pixels? I think you can tell the difference between maybe 100 and 500. But can you really tell the difference between 500 and I, I don't know that you can, so I think that's right. And what you're getting at is something that the text talks a lot about and something that you should recognize from the exam, which is that businesses purchase things because of derived demand. They don't purchase them because they want it, a priori, the way you want the iPhone. You want the new iPhone, maybe for itself, because of what it says about you, that you're up, that you're hip, that you've got what your friends have, because you want to communicate with them more easily, and it's easier to do with iMessaging. How many of you have the iPhone? And how many of you use iMessaging on the iPhone? How many of you allow your friends to see whether or not you've read the iMessage? A lot of you haven't turned that off. Why not? You're basically letting your friends spy on you. They know when, you're, when you've read the message or not. And I get very agitated with my friends. I'm like, I know you have read my message. <laughs> Reply to me. Then I use the F word. <laughs> No. Answer me now. And businesses, this demand is not because I want to be able to see what my friends are. It's because I need the product or service or, or part to put into selling something else. So it's derived demand. Now, there are 300 
and 19 million people in the United States. Why would you want to sell to that market instead of the business to business market? If you add up, for example, the industrial market, there are 7.7 .7 million industrial sellers or buyers in the, in the nation. There are 1.5 million retail outlets approximately in the United States, 435,000 wholesalers. There are 8,000 or 89,500 governmental units. So when we talk about business to business, we include in that category of business to business organizations that buy, that service other people or products or uh, companies, not just for profit, but also non for profits and governmental entities in that business to business sector. That gives you a total of 9,725,000 people that you can sell to in this business to business context. That's far less the 319 million Americans in the U.S. So why would people want to sell in the business-to-business -business market? Well, what's the profit margin in things like retail, in the grocery store? What's the markup on average across their product line? How many items are in a grocery store? There are something like, in the average grocery store in the United States, there's something like 85,000 items. You think you have a lot of choice. Do you? Again, going back to rational acting theory, do you have a lot of choice? Or do you use heuristics to give you choices? Where do you usually buy? Stuff that's eye level. Right? Um, the average grocery store's profit margin is about 3 to 5 percent. What's the profit margin in business to business context in many instances? It can be huge. The profit margin can be much, much bigger than that. The company that I work for, the American Education Corporation, because it was all intellectual property software that we owned, the profit margins were astronomical. Two or three hundred percent. So that's one reason you might want to sell in this market. When we talk about personal selling in the professional sales program here, that's where most of our students will go, is into that business to business market. And they do very, very well. So there's lots of opportunity there. Sales are generally larger. Instead of selling one item for $75, you're selling multiple items or lots of items. So the purchases are generally a lot larger. What makes the business to business market different though than the consumer market? Well, marketing characteristics are different. So demand is derived, there are fewer customers, and their purchase orders are generally large. Products or services are generally or maybe technical in nature. And this is one of the reasons that personal selling is, in, is incredibly important. Being able to work with somebody and iron out the details on the specification. So again, for example, the company that I worked for, we would have to go into school districts and it took a salesperson to go in and figure out what it was that the individual school district needs. Are all school districts the same? in terms of their needs. We have a tendency to think, and there's a great debate right now going on, and in Oklahoma, they want to do away with anything that resembles something called the common core. Because our state legislature believes that that is an indication of Washington's imposing their will on local communities, and maybe local communities are better able to determine what the needs of their students are. And to some extent, I think that is true. Is the Oklahoma economy and the challenges that you will face as an employee going into that economy maybe somewhat different than if you grew up in New York City? I think so. There's maybe some legitimacy to that. Are all districts the same in terms of their abilities in things like reading, math, science? No, certainly some districts have greater deficiencies or deficits in certain areas. And so going into those areas and being able to figure out with those schools what 
their students needed in terms of being able to acquire those competencies and how they learn best. Do students all learn the same? They don't. And so depending on the type of population that you have, those kinds of things may be, may be important. And so those technical specifications, when we would design a learning management system for a school, it was highly labor intensive in terms of the sales process because we'd have to go in, we would have to analyze test scores from the district on things like standardized tests to see where deficiencies were so that we could offer solutions to the district that were meaningful to them and would help their students. The buying process. Usually you have, and this is important, and your text says something here that I'm not sure is generally uh, true. The buying center. Most organizations have a sort of formalized process for buying. And the text says, for large multi-chain stores retailers, such as Sears, 7-Eleven, and convenience stores, the buying center is highly formalized and is uh, oftentimes called the buying committee. However, and this is where I disagree with the text, most industrial firms or governmental units use informal groups. That's not true with regard to governmental units. Governmental units are highly formalized structures. And so understanding those and understanding the buying process in those is incredibly important. So for example, I think I alluded to this before and I talked about it. I did a study when I was a political scientist here to figure out what it costs to change a light bulb. Because I would tell students when I was a political scientist that there is nothing that government does that doesn't require money. My standing here and talking to you requires the government to spend money. How? They're paying my salary. They're turning on the lights in this building. You're not freezing, although maybe you are, I don't know. We can't seem to get the temperature right in any of our buildings because we're on a central loop and they tell us that that's more efficient, that they can monitor it. And they, we can't just turn on the air conditioning in, in the room. Johnson Controls monitors it remotely and half the time my students are either burning up, my office currently is burning up or they're sitting here freezing to death. I tell students you should dress in layers so that you can start taking things off depending on the classroom that you're in in this building. And some of them are enormously cold and others are pretty, pretty warm in the winter time. So there's nothing the government does that doesn't cost money. So I did this study at the time to figure out what it costs to change a light bulb. You would think that this would be fairly straightforward, change a light bulb. Well, I can't just get up and change the light bulb in my classroom, can I? No. They don't let me do that. They don't let me haul ladders around and start changing light bulbs. Why? It's what? Someone else's job. Someone else's job. Why is it someone else's job? Like a liability. I'm paying far too much money to be dragging a ladder around and changing a light bulb. The average, for those of you who want to become a PhD and go into marketing, the average salary of a marketing professor this year at AMA was $160,000 a year. Not a bad job. Right? I'm paid far too much. It would, it would cost a lot to have me drag you around the lab. I don't make $160,000. UCO doesn't pay that. <laughs> but I make over six figures. So, you know, it would be far too much, far too expensive to have me doing this job. It's also a liability, right? Somebody said, there's workers' comp issues. I could hurt myself, and that's going to be a lot more expensive than having somebody who doesn't make as much money as I am make on workers' comp, right? So if you look at the buying process, to change a light bulb at the time that I did the study, it cost about $100. From the time I put in a purchase order that said there's a light bulb out in my classroom to the time it got changed, it cost about $100 because you have to go back and figure out how we buy light bulbs. We have a purchasing department here that's highly formalized because we have state purchasing rules, so we have to submit bids. You have to do a request for proposal. And by the time you get all of that together and figure out what it costs to change a light bulb, I can guarantee it's more than $100 probably now uh, at, this, at this point in time if you figure out all of the labor involved and all of those steps. So these highly formalized buying centers, 
And that's a challenge to business-to-business -to -business salespeople, is figuring out who's in the buying center, who has influence, and who has actual purchasing decision-making authority. On this campus, for example, if you want to do business with UCO, who actually has the ability to purchase stuff? There are technically only two people that have the formal authority to sign off on purchases over anything like a thousand bucks. And who are they? Do you guess? The president of the university and the vice president for administration. Those are the only two people. So it's a highly formalized process in understanding this. What does that mean when you have this highly formalized process? So obviously when we purchase things like Desire to Learn, a horrible little learning management system. And I say this as a, somebody who has a lot of experience using learning management systems. It's a horrible system. When we decided to purchase that, did I have any influence? Well, at the time, I didn't because I didn't sit on the committee, but faculty members do. So understanding that those people have spheres of influence, but they can't actually pull the trigger because purchasing something like Desire to Learn is obviously more than $1,000. But you have, to, you have to engage those people who have influence within the buying decision making. So we have a committee that forms to look at learning management systems and then they make a recommendation. That committee is comprised of people from information technology, from administration, because we have to have a budget, from the faculty, because we're the ones that are going to have to use it. We actually included students in that decision-making process. There's only one or two people on this campus that actually have the authority to sign the contract that pulls the trigger for that to happen. And so understanding this buying center is enormously important in the business-to-business -business context. And understanding that formalized process. That can be a challenge for salespeople to figure that kind of thing out. Who are the gatekeepers that you have to get past in order to understand or in order to get your, uh, your, your product sold? That also increases the amount of time that it takes. If you go into professional sales and you're doing it in the business to consumer context, how quickly are you going to make sales? <clears throat> Fairly quickly. When people want to buy a suit, one of my students in the professional sales program that graduated last year has gone to work for Tom James, which is a company that manufactures clothing custom-made clothing. They come out and actually measure you and fit you. How often is he selling? The average Tom James suit sells for something like $5,000. His clients actually buy quite a bit, and they make decisions fairly quickly. They generally have high incomes. Seems like a lot, a big purchase, but they actually buy stuff. What's the buying decision time to, to get something like D2L? When D2L came out and talked to us, and uh, Blackboard came out and talked to us. What do you think the buying time took? It took over a year. Over a year. For us to decide, we wanted to get rid of WebCT and then engage in this. So the buying decision process, because of the number of people involved, the size of the order, the technical specifications, all of that becomes a lot longer. The lead time becomes a lot longer. Um, Price is often negotiated. Can you go into Dillard to negotiate the price? That's another difference in the characteristics of buying. You can generally negotiate the price. How do we negotiate the price in things like D2L? We get discounts based on the number of users that we're going to have, the type of licensing, the kind of specifications and features that we want. So for example, again, when I was in the private sector, the company that I did, we built learning management systems for K-12. If they didn't want certain content areas, we could discount the price. If they wanted the full thing, if they wanted all of the titles that we had, which were something like 275 titles when I was there, that was a lot more than if what they said was, we have a real problem with math, and all we want is a prescriptive uh, LMS for our math classes. So you can work those kinds of things out and that makes the, the, the process more negotiated and prices negotiated. Whereas in the business to consumer, it's less negotiated uh, in many instances. You should know there are a number of test questions. In looking at industries, we can measure these and the North American Industrial Classification System 
is a useful tool for businesses in the United States. It goes across the three countries of the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, which is Canada, the United States, and Mexico. And there are about four questions that ask you, for example, what the first three digits, four digits, five digits, and six digits in those systems use. So um, the first two digits designate a sector of the economy, the third a subsector, and the fourth an industry group. The fifth digit designates a specific industry. And uh, it's the most detailed level for which data are available. And the sixth digit designates an individual country, national level industry. So we can break all of this stuff down and look at the impact using this classification system and the data that's provided um, in these types of things from the government to analyze that kind of marketplace, which provides a rich area for market research and that stuff. Yes, ma'am. That is on page the NAICS is on page 140. So you'll want to look at that for the, uh, the next exam. Are there questions about purchasing? All right, well, you all did a good job. Let me have your papers for today so that I can give you credit. And there will be two points to everybody who showed up because we ran out of the snow today. So there's two bonus points for today's critical thinking to everybody. And then there will be critical thinking winners as well.